Hi everyone, welcome to episode 85 of the Startup Playbook podcast. My name is Rohit Pargava and each week I interview successful founders, investors and subject matter experts on how they got started, the strategies they use to succeed and their advice to current and future entrepreneurs. My guest for this episode is Patrick Llewellyn, the CEO of 99designs. Patrick initially spent a decade in boutique corporate advisory where he primarily worked with Australian technology and new media companies. He then joined 99designs in 2009, around 18 months after the business had launched, to set up their presence and office in the US. Fast forward nine years, and 99designs is the world's largest online graphic design marketplace connecting businesses looking for design work with more than 220,000 graphic designers from 192 countries around the world. Patrick has been the CEO of 99designs for the last seven and a half years, and alongside the growth of the business, he has overseen a raising of a $35 million Series A round from Excel in 2011 before raising a further $10 million in 2015. According to reports, 99designs is currently generating $60 million in revenue. We covered a range of topics in this interview, including understanding risk, their decision to shut down swiftly a popular spin-off brand created by 99designs, aligning personal and team focus, the importance of planning, and developing an evolving culture through hiring. Without further ado, here is my interview with Patrick Llewellyn. Hi, Patrick. Welcome to the Startup Playbook podcast, and thanks so much for taking the time to be on the show today. Thanks for asking me. And for hosting me at your magnificent offices as well. <laughs> yeah. um, for those people that may not be as familiar with you or your background, do you want to share a little bit about your story and what got you here today? Sure. So it's an unusual path. Um, it's perhaps not traditional, but I don't think anyone has a traditional path to a chosen profession anymore. So I studied business at school and then did a bunch of general sort of sales and marketing roles. I found myself in investment banking. I had a brief stint in between that where I planted a vineyard and decided to chase my dreams of, uh, you know, living a, a very organic uh, and prosperous lifestyle, but that made me very poor. So I got out of that pretty quickly. Um, yeah, corporate advisory. So I worked for a small boutique firm in Australia that mainly focused on supporting the startup ecosystem. So we were mainly helping people raise money in a period of time when it was hard to. So think post 2000 when sort of there was really almost no funding. There was a, a little bit of funding in Australia. Um, the VC community was just starting to, to get up the sort of first round of funds from 98 to, or really 97 through to 2002. And then it really sort of dried up, but I was sort of got into right the tail end of the dot-com one and then worked through that middle period. So we were mainly supporting media services businesses, you know, online classifieds, marketplaces, etc. cetera. Um, and what I found was really useful out of that period was I was always working for founders typically. So I was generally on the, the sell side of that. So I was either helping them sell their organization or raise capital. And so it was, I got to really know them and dig deep in strategy and, and, and try to really understand their business because you, you wanted to always feel like you knew their business as well as they did when you were yeah. out representing it. And so, um, and through that process, I got to meet uh, Mark Harbottle, who's the founder of 99designs or one of the co-founders with Matt Mitchevich. And, um, and, and, and then a good friend of mine, Lenny Mayo, was on Mark's board. And so we got to know each other sort of socially and then also in a business sense. And that led me to 99designs. So they pulled me out of corporate advisory in September of 2009, I think the, the sort of official date was, and um, I joined with an aim to really we it took a long time for us to figure out what I was going to do so we sort of talked about because just take a diversion for a second 99 designs was a spin out out of site point mm. and, and so therefore site point actually had a, another spin out flipper and had a group services arm so you know site point was kind of we referred it to the mothership and then it would provide services to 99 designs and flipper and 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 there was another spin out learnable and the sort of felt like it was like an almost an incubator um type ecosystem within the group yeah and so we we talked about do i provide group functionality and sort of provide you know sort of strategy or corp dev type advice to each of the units or do i um you know dive into one of them and you know, I really fell in love with 99designs at the time and, and could see I'd been doing some advisory work for a stock photography site in Sydney and so I could really 
I could see a lot of the dynamics that had played out in photography from sort of the, the beginning of microstock and how that was changing the face of the stock industry and the right and how that had played out and I felt like 99 designs was in a very similar position and so um, and so Mark and I ratified you know, sort of you know worked around that and decided that the best thing I could do was move to the states and open our office there and yep. so that's what I did. Interesting. Uh, you know, obviously th there's so much that I want to dive deeper on in, in terms of 99 designs, but I guess just, just taking a step back as well. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I'm sure there are a couple of listeners that are, um, that are listening that are, that are in a position where they're, you know, in a corporate job or, or working at, at a job and want to get either start their own startup or, or join a particular startup as well. Uh, I guess going back, you know, 99 designs is a, is a huge business now um, with sort of offices globally and, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, a bunch of staff and, and funding. But, um, I imagine uh, nine years ago when you when you joined, it was a very different uh, different kind of process. And so, what was that uh, decision making process like for you? What were some of you know what what made you want to jump, and how did you approach that? Uh, and also, what what was it about Ninety Nine Design specifically that that made you want to to mm -hmm. take that leap with them? Yeah, so I mean, there was a lot to take in at that time. I think the backdrop is I'd been working in corporate advisory for nearly ten years, and you know, macroly, that was a horrible time, 2009, right? 2008, 2007, we're obviously in the heart of the GFC. So, I mean, whilst we were still doing fine as a firm, you know, advisory work was is always kind of feast or famine. And mm. so that I, I was personally, it's a challenging treadmill that you're on. Um, I instantly uh, felt a really strong affiliation with Mark and really enjoyed our rapport and felt like I could trust him. And so that was a really important part of that, making that leap. I mean, I trusted Lenny, who was um, on the board of SitePoint. And so I kind of felt like I was, you know, I, I got to really know them. It, we did meet many times and it took quite a long time for us to sort of figure it finally out, but I did feel really comfortable. And Mark ran a very long process too. I got to meet the team and got to meet other operators within other business units and really started to, sort of feel that out um, and so that helped me. Um, it was still uh, a big change. You know, I had to tell my wife that I wanted to sell our house because I was worried that, you know, it might not work and so therefore I wouldn't have any money to get us home again from the States and so we sort of had to make a lot of structural changes just like you typically would for a startup leap. It felt you know, because we're only eight, so I, 99 Designs was eight or nine people when I joined. Mm. So we had some revenue. We were cash flow positive because um, we were bootstrapped, essentially. Um, but, you know, I wasn't sure. It was unknown entity still, right? Like, was it going to continue to perform well? Was I going to perform well? Was Mike going to be happy with my performance? You know, then obviously throwing in the fact that not only was I leaving a job that I'd been in forever, but I was moving country at the same time and moving a young family. Um, certainly added lots to the, what to take in, but it felt like the right time. And I was excited by, the thing that excited me most about 99 Designs was the fact that it, it did truly feel like we were shaking something up. That there was an industry that whilst there was all these customers who loved us, and so all of the customers at the time were coming through word of mouth. So basically when I joined, there was no money being spent on marketing at all. Um, and it was really just growing through the fact that it was delivering a really unique um, outcome to customers who were loving it. At the same time, it was causing some disruption in the designer community. And so when you Googled 99 Designs, when I Googled 99 Designs, the second um, search result was someone saying 99 Design scam and hating on our model and the fact that some designers weren't being paid and this is spec work and spec works bad and so I could and I and I f immediately that was when my pattern recognition came in and I'm like this is exactly what happened in photography mm. you, you know I stock shutter stock these firms when they entered with micro stock traditional photographers were like it's the devil this is terrible this is you know and then over time technology access to digital photography equipment, et cetera, et cetera. just meant there was a whole new breed of photographers making a great living off microstock. Some of the old style photographers realized that they could actually do really well out of it and that the old model was not necessarily the right model. And I felt that 99designs had the same sort of opportunity ahead of it. 
Yeah, uh, absolutely. I, I like just one of the things that I'd love to kind of uh, pick on that um, is, you know, I, I so I kind of went through. I think every kind of founder goes through this process when they decide to to launch a business or, or things like that, where they have to tell their partners and their friends and family and, and all of those things. And there's a bunch of what are you doing? <laughs> uh, but I, and I, you know, I think that, that there's often this assumption that that founders are or people that decide to jump into startups are huge risk takers. But I think it's often, um, you know, as you mentioned, you were willing to kind of mortgage or, or sell your house because you were, you know, you you were prepared for that not really working out or that kind of situation not not really coming through. Mm -hmm. And I think that's that's kind of just a common theme that I see with a lot of founders in general is that it's not they understand the opportunity, but they also understand the the reality of, of things not really working out and being prepared and, and trying to minimize that risk as much as possible. Yeah, interesting. I hadn't thought about it that way. But yeah, I think it some people just focus a hundred percent, don't care about risk. I was in a different position because I was and I think a lot of your listeners would be in a similar position where you're like, oh hang on, I'm not the twenty-something um, startup founder who has no responsibility and can work back out of my, you know, parents' bedroom. You know, I left home at eighteen. I didn't really think that I would have the, you know, there was no moving back when you've got three little kids. <laughs> you know, so you you kind of so that's part of your responsibility as a, you know, well I felt the responsibility with my family situation was that I had to have something lined up. Yeah, um, but it was more of a parachute. You know, and we. We laughed about it because we um, financially would have been a lot better off keeping our house uh, in Sydney because we never needed to touch the money, which was great. Mm. But it was also nice to be able to make have that so that you could take risk. And that was a really important thing for me was that I felt like I could take these risks, put things um, – because what was the worst case scenario? I spent all our savings. Mm. Um, it's not the worst thing in the world to chase a dream um, yeah. and to get the opportunity to learn and – work with some people that I felt really passionate about so yeah absolutely so um kind of walk walk me through what was that process like when you did decide to join and jump in and then you're suddenly in a new country with a family and trying to to lay the groundwork for for 99 designs in the US what what was that what was that like for you exciting uh, uh somewhat stressful too of course um what I consult so I worked um I joined in September, so I had th almost three months in the, in the Melbourne office, but I was actually living in Sydney at the time, so I was commuting sort of one week on, one week off um, for the first couple of months, and then I moved down here in December, um, and, and we lived in Sydney just out of temporary accommodation in South Bank um, for six or, eight, six or eight weeks until the visa came through. Um, it's a whirlwind. I can't even, I don't know if I can remember back to that time now. It's so long ago. But this is early 2010. Um, I was lucky. We had one guy on the ground already, um, Jason Aiken, and Sightpoint had a manager, um, a, a great lady called Juanita. And, and so um, part of our prep was I, I went over to the States in October and sort of did it with Mark and we did a scouting mission of like where do we think we should have an office and where do we, you know, and, and, and I got to spend more time with Jason. And so when I arrived, we already had a little office where we could sit and so a lot of that stuff was relatively easy. Um, I think easier for me than your typical founder leaping into the United States for the first time. We had gone through all the pain of setting up a corporate services entity so that I could be employed. We'd got my E3, beat, you know, like sort of done a lot of those things. But then it was really hitting the ground running and things started flying at me from all sorts of directions. And, you know, I think within two weeks I was flying to LA to meet with a potential investor, which was not what we had planned. And, you know, there was, it was kind of just sink or swim, yeah. you know, and it, w it was a real whirlwind. And, and we found ourselves running really fast just because of the um, strategic inputs that were coming in and yeah, so we can dig in that if you like. But uh, the reality of it, that first year, not everything was plain sailing. Um, mm. We thought uh, that, you know, we had strategic interest in the business. Mark and Matt decided they were interested in that strategic interest. So that was pretty shocking for me, really, in, in hindsight, in that I just sold my house and was going to move my, move my family 10,000 miles away on what I thought would be a three-year journey. <laughs> it's now obviously been a lot longer. Mm. Um, 
there was an opportunity potentially we could have potentially sold the business and so we did spend a fair bit of time exploring that um, we did a lot of testing around marketing acquisition and realized that a whole lot of stuff that we were trying just wasn't working so we had to reduce headcount um, which in those days didn't mean um, firing people, it just meant we lost them to back to site point. So that, you know, some of our really great engineers had to go back and, and we no longer had access to them and we, ne we never got them back. Or some of them we got back when we employed them years later. But because, um, you know, we, Mark and Matt just didn't want to run the business um, cash flow negative. And so we had to get back into the positive and, you know, growth slowed down dramatically. Um, and we had to unleash a whole lot of new opportunities. And at the same time, I was meeting investors and talking to the few corporate partnerships that we had, and we started building a team, and I was hiring you know, for the first time alongside Jason. And so we were learning a lot of stuff on the fly. So it was, a lot of it felt very much like the startup experience because we were away from SitePoint then, mm -hmm. you know, like we were literally in one room. We had to paint that room. You know, I remember the excitement when we all got, you know, pot plants on our, <laughs> and not not the sort of pot plants we think of in Australia, but, you know, pot plants on our desks and, um, you know, started to, like, f foster um, sort of some, some sort of company feel. Like, we're in a co-working space, but we, we, we felt like we were pretty special because we had our own little tiny room um, in a dilapidated pier, Pier 38, which was right next to the ballpark in San Francisco. It got shut down um, about a year into that. So we had 30 days to move because it was deemed unsafe. But it was a very cool um, place. Um, and it was great to be in. Like the, You could spend 40 minutes just talking about the stories there. You know, um, TaskRabbit was founded there. They were using us. So I got exposed to Layla and the team. Um, Instagram started there. And so wow. the, at one point, the boys were doing a big deploy and the internet and the co-working space went down and we had our own. So they came in and, and, and had to um, get a patch up because they were just starting to get whacked. Someone had, you know, I think it was a TechCrunch article, their first TechCrunch article or something had gone and that was just servers were melting down. And so they had to deploy from our office and stuff like that. So it was, that was a, a wild ride as mm -hmm. well. And, and certainly, you quickly, I was very quickly exposed to what is Silicon Valley, you yeah. know, with investor meetings and um, the power of the venture capital community and how open they were and the fact that lots of founders in the Bay Area are really, help, are really helpful and happy to speak. And I found that very different from my experience in Australia. Mm. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, on, on that, um, you know, obviously we, we kind of look at uh, look at the US and and from an expansion standpoint of, you know, culturally it's it's similar. Um, you know, we speak the same language. There's, I, I think that there's the assumption that just uh, um, expanding and, and starting an office in in the US is is relatively straightforward. Um, I guess what were some of the the unexpected lessons or challenges that that came up from from both operating and and kind of expanding out into into the US. Mm. Yeah, so the one thing you th I always thought of the U.S. as like a low regulatory environment, you know, free economics, capitalism at its purest, all of those sorts of things. And so when you get, you realize that it's actually not the case and there's lots of regulations and getting anything done is actually a lot harder than you'd thought. And, you know, just simple stuff like mm. there's not really online banking. You know, I remember when I finally got my Wells Fargo account set up and they told me I had online banking and I paid a bill, that, you know, it was a couple of days overdue and, I, and then I get a call from, and they're like, well, we haven't been paid yet. And I'm like, well, I did it online. And that's when I learned that in fact, online banking and, uh, meant that the bank wrote a check and still mailed out the check. And so they, you know, whereas we'd been banking, I hadn't owned a checkbook, I don't think in Australia for a few years then, you know, yeah. already, right? Like we were already, well advanced so there was simple things like that so it was it was a bit more complicated uh, regulatory than I anticipated and then culturally it was obviously very different you know the first time I started interviewing were for customer support roles and we were paying $15 an hour um, on an hourly rate you know um, and the people we were interviewing were asking me about our option scheme <laughs> you know we didn't have one at that time so yeah. it, that was kind of confront it sort of quickly showed me that I was in a boom town. This was a gold mining town and everyone was there chasing their dreams and it didn't matter what role they were playing. They were sort of much more sophisticated in their understanding 
of the environment than we were used to in Australia. Um, and then, you know, I, I mean, I do think the US is great for Australians. Um, the one thing that is great is that generally most people like us and, and, and so therefore your accent is a, is a way of breaking the ice and gives you something that people want to talk to you about. And mm. so I felt I did find that to, you know, make that transition relatively easy. But then there's lots of things that you need to learn. Um, and we are different, but there are lots of values that are very much the same. Sure. Uh, one of the other things that you mentioned earlier was uh, a lot of opportunities came up for, mm. for 99 Designs as well. Um, and obviously, you know, over the 10 years, there have been a, a range of different things that have, that have happened. But one of the things that I wanted to touch on was, was Swiftly, um, which was, from my understanding, a, a new sort of product or, mm -hmm. or a service that you were offering. Yep. Do, you, do you want to explain a little bit about what, what Swiftly was? Yeah, sure. Let's, can we take two steps back? Well, one step back. So the one step back is I think the big opportunity that did rise for us was Excel. And so we were able to, one of the things about being in the Valley for us was we got all this exposure to the venture capital community. And, and one of the things that we did have was because we were acquiring our customers through word of mouth, we were mainly acquiring customers in the US. And that's the one thing that I think is really important. So that's why it was really natural for us to move there. 88% mm -hmm. of our customers were actually US based, right. even though we were solely based in Australia. Right? So we only operated as a dot com and we only took payment in US dollars. Right? So we were very much fixated on that market from the get go. Mm -hmm. Because we were having some success and a lot of our founders, one, SitePoint was well established in the tech community and the founder community in the Valley in particular. And so it meant that we were helping founders and then founders were helping us get exposed to VCs. So we actually had lots of inbound interest, which is not necessarily the case for everyone. So we were quite lucky or blessed or fortunate or well executed, any way you want to think about it. But mm. we were able to take meetings with venture capitalists and Mark and Matt didn't want to take venture capitalists money. So it was an interesting position to be in um, and one that allowed us to do the Excel transaction in 2011. And then from there, we sort of thought about different ways in which we could grow the business. So what the first thing we did was international expansion. So we can come back to that if mm -hmm. you think that's interesting for the, so we, we did a bunch of stuff, we did an acquisition and then we're like, cool, how do we grow outside our core business of design contests? Um, we'd already introduced a service called um, online projects, which was where you could work with a designer after you had met through the, a contest and work with them one-to-one, -one, so kind of one-to-one -one projects. And so we had launched that and we were really struggling, we'd str and we still do to this day, struggle with delineating between the product types. Mm. And we wanted to introduce an, another product type or an engagement type, it's not really a product type, and this is kind of part of our learning, it was an engagement type where you could do quick tasks fast. And so the whole idea was we'd always meet people who would say, hey, I really just wanna fix this file or do this, can you help me do that? You know, how do I, I don't see a category for changing the colors in my logo, I only see a new logo. And, and so we decided that there was an opportunity to to explore there and you know obviously being in the valley we're like okay cool we wanted to make sure that we kept some of our small startup feel so we created almost a mini startup within the startup a few engineers um, led by our um, CTO at the time Lachlan Donald and we launched swiftly and so and the rationale be behind a new brand was we didn't know how to tell people what a contest or a project was. How could we possibly tell them what this third, you know, small task was? Mm. So let's do it under a new brand and, and let's try and push that. And so, sure. yeah, so that, that was the opportunity set. Sure. So, um, so from my understanding, uh, Swiftly was, was quite a popular, mm -hmm. um, popular product or, or a brand. Um, but then uh, uh, was it about a year in? Oh, yeah, it was 18 about eight, eighteen months in. Yeah, eighteen months in. Um, you decided to to um, to stop working on yeah. on, on that particular startup, yeah. which, you know, again can be a really really difficult thing to a decision to make, especially when something is working. Mm -hmm. So, um, again, do you want to talk a little bit about the the rationale um, bit behind why you decided to to swap, to stop swiftly? Yeah, we were still resource constrained and we felt like 
so one, it, it grew well. Like it had pretty good early adoption, um, but we didn't really break outside 99 Designs customers. And so mm. one of the realizations was um, we'd introduced a new brand with the hope that we could acquire new customers with that new brand. And that proved to be, that is very hard and establishing a new brand's tough. And I think mm. we underestimated that and how long that can take and the sort of capital you need to throw at it. And so I think we probably underinvested in, in, in the brand building part of it. Um, and so what we'd successfully done was introduced a service that people liked, but not introduced a brand. And so I would be walking around and listening to customer support calls and hearing people having to spell out swiftly. Oh, you know, it's a sister company, it's SW, you know, so like this notion that we were taking people to this new service or showing them where on the site that the link was, et cetera, et cetera, was actually causing a bunch of confusion. Yeah. And it wasn't really helping us acquire a whole bunch of new customers that we'd hoped, right? So we sort of found ourselves in that position. Whilst it was still growing okay, it wasn't sort of the incremental growth rates that we were looking for and our core business was still growing pretty well. Yeah. Um, and so we decided that those resources would be better used, deployed um, internally um, and that we felt that this service was more appropriate from the platform. And so we really started to think of 99 Designs as a platform and not as a contest site. And so we felt that what really at our core, what we are awesome at is, um, you know, providing access to this amazing design community and curating that design community and then giving you different ways to work within that design community. And by spinning out this brand and separate code base and separate functionality, we were quickly finding ourselves recreating a whole bunch of the functionality that we'd already built. And so we we're like, look, this service offering is really valuable. Well, val valuable to a bunch of customers, um, but it'd be better placed if we could provide that value via 99 designs. So that was the sort of the rationale. So step one was like, cool, we'll, we'll just call it tasks and we'll get rid of it um, as a brand. And so we sort of jettisoned the Swiftly brand and became 99 Designs Task. And so it was just then a link on our site. But then still maintaining that code base just meant that there was a few engineers working standalone on that and we wanted to be able to deploy them. And for us, we had made the decision that we needed to get cash flow positive over the next few years and so therefore you know, we, we, we weren't going to raise more money um, and the funding environment at the time was had changed dramatically. And so we're like, okay, we'll have to make the tough decision. And so we jettisoned that, um, you know, and that was a business that most people would have probably maybe even gone and got funding for because mm -hmm. it was, you know, significant. We also killed another business that was significant in size, you know, sort of million million dollars in revenue type stuff um, because we we really wanted to focus on our core and we wanted to simplify what we were working on and simplify management effort um, and and try and get everything together again. With the view from there, we could expand out again and that these services won't be lost from us, mm. but we it was just gonna take time. Because one of the things that I have experienced is the fact that, you know, we'll, we're, a rel we're 10 years old now. Um, we are... Uh, we were a spin out of another company. So we had lots of legacy code issues. And, and, and so it, it just meant that um, we had to invest a lot um, in rewriting code bases and moving to new code bases and sort of getting our core infrastructure um, where we needed to be. And doing that in a whole bunch of places was really expensive. Sure. Uh, um, I, I just want to come back to, to the focus bit. But um, one of the things that... Um, that becomes really challenging when you when you do have uh, you know a specific group of engineers or part of your team that's working on a particular project and you decide to kill that project mm -hmm. it can be really hard to, to motivate them or get them to, to kind of buy into things yep. um, do you have any advice for anyone that, that's had to go through that process or, or is currently going through that process uh, yeah I mean like for us it was really about making sure that we had a clear vision for the future um, we had a rallying cry you know that we wanted to um, be masters of our own destiny that this view that hey you know we were seeing and in that period of time this is um 2015 at that period of time businesses like our businesses of our ilk series a series b were starting to fail right mm -hmm. and um there was a real sort of gloom and doom over the valley for about six to nine months so it was maybe two quarters particularly though end of q was oh maybe longer three quarters 
Um, and so there was a real expectation that 2016 was going to be the end of the world and that um, everyone had to batten down the hatches. And so we really rallied around this notion that, hey, we want to be masters of our own destiny, that we, you know, to, we owe it to ourselves, we owe it to our community, we owe it to our customers to make sure that we set the, the, the framework in which we can be a prosperous company forever and a day and we don't have to rely on anyone else's input. And so the, having that, I think, helped. Um, it wasn't as exciting for those few engineers who were working on the small startup. Um, so, I, you know, I think it was tough motivationally for some people. Um, but, you know, eventually they get over it, they get in, they get to do interesting work. We continued to invest in them. We continued to provide access to R&D days. And, you know, we were moving onto new code bases. We had sort of what were reasonably good technical challenges for people to tackle still. Um, we embarked on a big rebrand. So we really did, like we had a lot of things that we threw at people that created a sense of purpose mm. um, and gave them something really meaningful to work on. And so by having all of those things, I think that that helped. Um, but, you know, Swiftly was still beloved and, you know, you'll still see people wearing the old T-shirts and, uh, you know, there's a llama floating around out there uh, that was the mascot at the time. So um, it's certainly still a legacy and we're all excited about where we are in our development today. So we've done a lot of that heavy lifting. Um, we're really invested in what we call direct work now. We see the future where we can now match designers real time with work opportunities. So we're not miles away from unleashing that tasks types functionality on our community again and, and on our customers and so we're kind of like we, we you know it was a, basically a three-year journey to get to where we are now mm. um, and um, but we've stayed true to that I think that's benefited I guess just, just kind of building on that and, and going back on the on the focus piece um, you know it can be it's, I found it's incredibly hard when you're running a business, when you're moving a million miles an hour, you've got a million different things going on to find that focus as well. Uh, is there anything that, that you found that's, that's worked for you or any particular um, process that you go through or anything that kind of brings you back and helps you find that focus to then... And then uh, once you've found that for yourself, how do you then um, extrapolate that out across the rest of the team? Yeah, I think personally it's really hard. I don't know if I've got any really good answers for people. Hopefully I can get some from you or someone else because I think that personal focus is hard especially at the top like because you've got so many inputs as a founder or a CEO or, and so I think obviously hiring the best team you can is part of that and I've got some great people who focus on parts of the business so that helps um, give me some opportunity to focus uh, a little more um, but I, th I think that is personally it's a huge ch challenge um, yeah. for the business just cementing a plan having your team work on that plan telling them what the challenge that you're trying to solve is um, publishing it building it repeating it I don't think we repeat enough still we kind of constantly um, surprised uh, by just how much you need to repeat stuff um, to get the message through um, I think it's something that we're still working on today Right, like how, because that's that's what it's really about. Focus is really about everyone believing the path forward and buying into the plan and executing it. And it's it's difficult when it's the mundane, right? and that's the tough part, right? Like we've, you know, we had a big guess, you know, organic traffic issues, and you know, we've had to do things that kind of just you know, rebuilding code bases, not rebuilding functionality is kind of like it whilst it's somewhat interesting it's also can be frustrating and it's kind of boring in that all you really want to do is build new features and for customers or new products for customers or and so got to kind of figure out ways of showing how that ladders up yeah right and and, and where that focus is so our big tips are Build a plan that people are bought into. Try and get as many people as you can in the organisation to feel like they own that plan and then report against it and show how progress is being made. And so that, for us, was as boring as how are we getting to profitability, where are we going, have we hit our targets, where are we on our hitting our targets, reporting on that, providing dashboards to that, giving people access to data has helped. But, you know, I think the reality of it, it's an ongoing process that 
we're still working on and you know we need to learn from others to do it better because i don't think we've got it right either yeah absolutely unfortunately i have zero advice for you when it comes to focus (laughs) um i I guess one one of the things that i found personally and again as you mentioned it's just an ongoing process for me uh is to try and work out what it as you mentioned you know what is the longer term vision that we're building towards i think that the path is always for me changing and deviating but it's just staying true to that to that vision mm-hmm. uh, and just working out hopefully what's what's the best way best yeah. way forward if the, yeah if the yeah and that's right i think those planning i'm a big believer in business plans and financial forecasts and goals and you know like goal setting has always been an important personal part for me and so therefore i think as a company it's helped us um mm-hmm. and and so that if you do that then that you know, sometimes there's lots of argument about being too aggressive and not aggressive enough and did you get the plan right? And, you know, one of the things that we do is publish the plan and talk people through it and then say, but, you know, I always remind them from January onwards that, you know, the plan is there to be changed, right? Yeah. That reality, to your point, the path is going to deviate. We don't know what inputs are coming. Mm. You know, what is going to happen in the broader macroeconomic environment as we're going to see some customer shift. There's all sorts of things that you need to be reacting to. So the... The plan is there to be changed, but it's good to have goals and aspirations and a path forward that you yeah. can map out, and then and that will continue to change. But that certainly has that's su- super important. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, one of the things that you sh- you just mentioned about business plans, I've had a couple of guests on the show that have flat out said that they hate the idea of business planning in yeah. general, both from like the investor and, and the founder side. Um, is there a you know is there a particular stage where like do you think everyone should be writing business plans or or kind of having those forecasts or is there a particular stage where it makes the most sense for for people to do that i think as soon as you need to communicate it past the people that you've got around you right Mm. i think the and i'm not a huge i mean i think financial forecasting you shouldn't spend forever doing it because you're never going to get it right Mm. right like we have we explain that it's in in we're trying to obviously we our aspiration today is to be a listed company so we actually have to get good at it now Mm. um, because we need to hit our numbers and so that's become really important to us over the last few years as we start to think about how do we prepare to be a public company so for us that has changed a lot i think if you're a small startup i agree you know we were two or three years in before we actually had our first formal forecast right so early on i think you need to have a vision mm. uh, you need to understand your customers you need to understand the solution that you're trying to build you need to iterate on that and I agree you don't necessarily need it super early on but as soon as you've got a handful or more than a handful of people that you're needing to do, communicate with then having something is super is, is super useful and I found it personally we found it very useful when we were raising money to have a vision that we could talk to our investors about Um, Because in the end, they wanted to look at our financials. They wanted to look at our financial forecasts. They wanted to have a look at what our plan was. You know, I don't, I don't believe her in that to be. I don't necessarily think it needs to be a word doc. You Mm. know, like I think it can be a very high level document. You know, typically ours are always in Keynote, you know, or PowerPoint or whatever presentation, Google Doc, (laughs) Um, and it should be directional. Not yeah. necessarily super detailed, but it is. It certainly is a way of painting a vision that I think is is useful. Absolutely, I, I think just just the uh, I think the process of going through that and understanding what do like the numbers or, or what needs to be action for your business um, is a really valuable exercise to go through. So I've had I don't know if you know Adrian Stone, who's a local angel investor, yep. he's from Angel Cube. Um, uh, one of the things when I interviewed him for the podcast, he mentioned was that he just did a, literally a back of the envelope thing to work out what is the market size that he needs to reach for the type of business that he's trying to build. And he's like, I can't do that here. I have to go to the US. Mm -hmm. And so he made that decision. Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of what we do with Playbook Media when we're working with startups is also, you know, they want to grow to X, like that, that's a number. We just try and reverse engineer that. So how many visitors do you need? What's the conversion rate? Like, you know, what does that actually look like? And then what are the inputs for that? Mm -hmm. And often, like, it's just really surprising that not enough people go through that process they, they're just an arbitrary goal that they set and then the, you know it, it's just really hard so I, th- I think that whole process of understanding what it takes to actually get there is, is critically important yeah and then there's and you start to get users understanding the data right like what mm. is my conversion rate what happens if i improve that is it good or bad i don't really know right like so i go talk to people understand okay what would be industry standard for us okay well you need data to go talk to people you need some understanding and then you figure out like it gives you, I think it just gives you greater visibility on what your levers may be. Yeah. 
Um, and then as you get bigger, it, that's obviously becomes an important part of your planning process. Sure. Um, so, yeah. so, so speaking of getting bigger, mm -hmm. um, you know, obviously you, you joined 99 Designs about a year in. So, and yeah, we're about 18 months old, but like realistically, we're a little bit older than that in practice because we're a spin out. So we started as um, site point marketplace, like 99, the functionality of 99 Designs started in site point. Yeah. But we were spun out in February of 08. I joined in September of 09. Um, so that's about 18 months, I think, or something like that. And then, um, yeah. Yeah. And congratulations on your 10 year um, anniversary, which, you, which you. you guys just celebrated. But um, again, from, uh, from a founder's perspective, especially for those people that are just starting out, really curious to understand how, uh, how your role, uh, both your role and, and the company has changed, evolved over the last sort of nine to 10 years that, mm. that you've been with 99 Designs. Well, I answered the phones a whole lot less for customers <laughs> today because when we moved to the States, right, like it, it was all hands on deck and we were experimenting with things like what happens if we put a phone number on our site? Okay, well, if the phone starts ringing, you need to answer it. You know, so I think um, the practicalities of what I do day to day has, has evolved and changed. Um, yeah, I think now it's a balance between... I mean, a lot of my focus still goes on people. And so back then it was people. Um, it was um, hiring new people. Like, you, you know, today I do less of the day-to-day -day hiring. Like, we've got teams of people doing all of that. Um, obviously still engaged in it um, when required. Um, but I think we've, we have systematised a lot of that. Um, so I'm still thinking about the welfare of the team, my team. Are we working on the right things? Where are we going? Who are our stakeholders? Engagement with stakeholders, um, I think. And then that's the balance. Sure. And that's so, yeah. I, I mean, it's, it's certainly changed, right? Like, and, and it is um, obviously a lot more stakeholder management based um, as you evolve, but Excel are amazing. And so I've got a very private company feel still, mm. but we're starting to think about how do we practice for being a public company at some point in the future. So, you, you know, just lots of looking at how do you communicate more? I think a lot of what we look at is how do we improve the way in which we communicate to our own team? Because mm. we're in three different like geographies. Um, but then it's day-to-day -day management still. You know, as my direct team, how are they going? What are they working on? How do I help them solve their problems? You know, the broader health of the organization, um, you know sort of data and then, you know, how's the business performing? Are we going to meet forecasts? Sure. Are people working on the right stuff? You just touched on one of the points that I think we, uh, that gets brought up a lot on the podcast, which is the, the challenges of hiring and, and how that kind of evolves as the company sort of scales as well. Um, has, has the hiring process or what you look for in hires changed at all from when you first joined 99 Designs to, to what that process is like now? Obviously, sort of understanding that, that you're not as involved in, in that mm -hmm. process. Yeah, it has. I mean, I think we are much more aware of the fact that in the early days we were, um, we were hiring from what we knew, right? So all of a sudden we looked around our office and felt like, realised it was pretty homogenous, right? Yeah. That the reality of it was when we were hiring engineers, we were hiring engineers that looked and felt and, like us. So... We had 17 blokes and two women in our office in Melbourne or something. You, you, you know, like it was all of us. So we, we just realised that we needed to evolve. So our hiring practices, you know, we, we're much more, we, we, we're evolving the culture of the organisation so that we can be a lot more inclusive. I think in the early days, we weren't trying not to be inclusive. We felt like we were very open and we've all got really strong values around that, but we weren't doing anything proactively to change, what, you know, our pattern recognition. And so we were, we've been lucky to hire great managers into the organisation who's helped us think about that. And when hiring them and saying, hey, this is important that I'm involved in an organisation that really helps create an inclusive culture that means that we can hire a much more diverse workforce. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, that we've evolved our thinking on that. We evolve our hiring practices. We are evolving constantly. Like, how do we even try to attract talent so that we can build a... a, a we're going younger. We're taking internships now and, and have a grad program for engineering, for example, just to give us the opportunity to, you know, sort of foster a more diverse working environment. Um, 
And so, yeah, I mean, we've done reasonably well. Like globally, our, our gender split's 50-50, and each of the offices has different challenges, you mm. know. Um, uh, diversity in Oakland means something very different to diversity in Melbourne. Um, you know, whereas here we're focused a lot on gender. In, in Oakland, you focus more, you know, it's like diversity is means many things. Mm -hmm. Gender's just one of those. Um, and so... Um, yeah, we've kind of had to uh, grow up because our, our understanding was that if we were not to evolve our hiring practices, we weren't going to get access to the best talent pool. And the talent pool shrinks pretty quickly when you're just hiring the same sorts of people as a lot of other people. So the broader we could cast the net, the higher quality talent we could access and ultimately the better business that we could be. And yeah. so... Um, um, I'm pretty proud of how we've progressed. We've got a lot of work to do. Obviously, engineers in Australia, people have probably talked, you know, it's hard to find, um, you know, women, young women in those roles, but we're having some success and, and um, you know, we're continuing to evolve. And, and then culturally, it just means you have to think about what are the activities you do. And it's not just gender, right? It's mm. age. And so we want to make sure that we're supporting people with families. And so work-life balance becomes more important. Activities other than Friday night drinks become important. Like, you, you, you know, you sort of have to think about all of these different inputs. And so yeah. that has changed um, the way we think about the business. We continue to evolve it, and then that plays out to hiring. Sure. Um, mindful of the time. So, so yep. final question on my side, just, again, on, on the cultural piece as well. I think, you know, there's, there's often this train of thought that you hire people that that fit into to your culture um i interviewed duncan anderson from ed roller who kind of stressed that they look for um or at least what i took away from it from that conversation was that they look for people that that kind of add to the culture of of the team mm -hmm. um again just just really curious to kind of know your viewpoints in terms of like culture as a whole and, yeah. and the people that you, you that you do go about is there is there a um you know, I guess what's the balance between here's the culture that we're trying to, to build around and, and we're kind of happy with this versus, you know, we're really trying to evolve this over time. Yeah, I think so. What you hope for is that you're hiring people with the same values, but then they can have obviously a very different perspective. So as yeah. long as at their core, there's sort of some common belief systems, then I think the culture can move in the right direction. And so we definitely, you know, so definitely you're trying to, and we, the, it's the same everywhere, right? Like people don't want to hire people who are going to erode that or don't have their same values. Um, so we still value trying to dig in and understanding the core values of people, but we are very cognizant of the fact that we need to get different viewpoints to make us a stronger organisation. And so different viewpoints are, is that m melting pot of where did you come from, that you've got a different background to me, be it educationally, be it race, sex, whatever that is. The more, the more voices we can get in the mix, the stronger, the better we'll be. And, and I think we are pretty good at listening. I mean, I think everyone's got, we've got to get better at listening. Like, um, but we really do value the input um, that we get from our team um, and, and think that that evolves our culture. Like I think culture is just this constant working playbook, right? Like we're not setting the culture. Our culture is what, who and what we are. And that is the sum of all of the parts. And so we're, you know, we, we're constantly tweaking the way in which we operate our business. It's almost like what you do in a product standpoint, right? Mm. You're looking for inputs. What are we learning from our team today? You know, we do we support a Melbourne company, our cold tramp surveys, you know, sitting down and talking one-on-ones, all of that stuff. You're constantly trying to figure out, okay, what are we doing right? And what aren't we doing right? How do we change to make the business better and that and the big part of that is focusing on culture and it ebbs and flows and we see it all the time right? we get it right in one place and get it wrong in another and you know it's just it's a constant work in progress but I think if everyone comes to the table with some basic core values um, and we do you know for us it's really important that they respect everyone respects each other and that you know at a core at the very core of our business you know, I was once asked at a, a CEO saying, like, if you could use one word to describe your business, what would it be? Um, and I said, caring. And I think, um, and that is still very core to us. Because, you know, at our, we're a marketplace. We, we, at our very core, you know, 
we're evolving into a platform, but we care about our customers, we care about our design community, and we really care about our people. And so, if, and we've always had that. You know, the fact is, word of mouth is still a huge driver for us. 40, 50% of our customers still come through word of mouth. So you, to foster that, you've really got to take care, right? Yeah. And the only way you can take care of your customers is by taking care of your employees. So core to add is for we've got this, you know, putting people first. And so we do that from a product perspective. We think about how do we give our designers more opportunity? How do we continue to help them evolve their business practices so that they can be the best designers that they can? How do we you know, give our customers access to those designers in the most efficient ways? But we're always thinking from a people-centric viewpoint. How do we help those relationships? How do we, and then likewise, that then flows through. I sort of said it's hard to have people care for your customers and your designers unless they feel like you care for them. And so we, that's important part of it absolutely very cool um patrick thanks so much for coming on the show uh, i don't know if i've mentioned this before in a previous podcast but 99 designs was actually the first place that i came to when i officially moved down to melbourne so like i literally I remember i got my keys put my stuff down came down to it an event at 99 designs i've still got the t-shirt and i still wear it around as well so we, thanks so much for, we'll for, get you a new t-shirt today <laughs> <laughs> um yeah thanks thanks so much for, for everything as well and obviously thanks so much for coming on the show uh, for anyone that wants to find out more say hello get in touch um, yeah. what's the best way for them to do that? Um, yeah, so the best way to hit me up is, pr- I mean, I'm not very easy to get, so you can just email me at patrick at 99designs or on LinkedIn or, you know, I'm not particularly social on the other medium, so um, that's probably as good a way of any way. Obviously, our site, 99designs.com.au for the Aussies um, is the place to come find us. Um, we hold a bunch of events here, so if you're in Melbourne um, and you're into, you know, where there's the CS events run here, there's, you know, other um, coding events are run here. We had women in product here on Tuesday night, so we do try to utilise our space as an event space, so keep a lookout um, for opportunities to come and visit us. Um, we are open, encourage people to come say good day. If you've used our product and leave us feedback, we're always trying to learn from our customers. And if you're a designer on our platform, you know, likewise, make sure that you're active in our forum. Fantastic. Patrick, once again, thanks for coming on the show. Cheers. Thanks, mate. Thanks for listening to episode 85 of the Startup Playbook podcast. You can find the show notes of my interview with Patrick, along with a curated list of tools and resources for startup founders at startupplaybook.co. As always, you can join the conversation through our Twitter account. The handle is at Playbook Startup. I'm traveling to the US next week, so I will not get to publish any episodes during that time, but have some amazing interviews that I'm lining up while I'm over there, which I'm excited to share with you shortly. In the meantime, don't forget to subscribe to stay up to date with our latest interviews and make sure you check out our new YouTube channel. Thanks for listening, and I'll see you at the next episode.